Wow, this is a really great turnout. Super excited for 11 a.m. So welcome to Why Bitcoin Wins and Decentralized Technology in the Coming Global Revolution. We're the founders of Coin Beyond, and uh, we work at the Big Idea Lab, some co-working space in downtown Bellingham, and we're developing a Bitcoin debit card to get uh, more adoption and uh, more daily use of this awesome currency. But this presentation isn't about us, it's about Bitcoin in general. Yep. Um, and so, how many of you uh, already own some Bitcoin? Yeah, not bad. Um, how, how many of you uh, are at least fairly familiar with Bitcoin a little bit? Yeah, most people? Anybody here who's like completely new to Bitcoin? Yeah, at least one? Couple? Cool. All right. Uh, well, by the end of today, uh, you will all be armed with a lot of solid, compelling information about it. And also, any of you who don't own any Bitcoin yet at the end of today, um, come up and talk to us and we'll get you set up with at least a little bit, like in a wallet, you can take it home, you can become part of the Bitcoin community, like starting today. So yeah, come up to us afterwards. Okay, so, Bitcoin isn't the fiat currency. Most currencies in the world are fiat. And that means they're like state or bank backed. And um, so they use like uh, the com competition of trade or they use military force in order to uh, give the value of their currency. Um, but uh, the inflation of these fiat currencies is inevitable. Like they, they, there hasn't ever been a fiat currency that has like not fallen because it just it will inflate and it will uh, eventually fall. Because governments can arbitrarily print however much more they want whenever they want, and the people can't stop them. And it's constantly happening all over the world. We don't really see it here. We have some inflation, like a few percent, but it's it's not that bad here actually. Um, and then we export the dollar. The dollar is the wor world reserve currency right now. Uh, you can go anywhere in the world and they basically have their country's currency and the US dollar. And people are happy with that. Um, but with the world kind of relying on this like US dollar and it's dangerous when the US dollar is starting to fail. Like we keep having these like uh, bank bailouts and stimulus packages that keep the dollar up. But um, if the dollar falls, it's, it's a global catastrophe. The dollar is being held up artificially and uh, being devalued through inflation because our government can just uh, arbitrarily print more whenever it needs to uh, raise our debt ceiling and pay the bills. So it's time for a change. There are roughly two-thirds of the world that don't have access to banking right now. Or they, the banks charge a bunch of money in order to do anything with them. Like, if you want to send money to a third world country, they're going to charge you more for, for that country being more poor. So, of those two-thirds of the world that don't have access, there are billions of people that do have access to internet. And the access to internet gives them an access to Bitcoin. So, now with Bitcoin, um, somebody in Africa can charge their phone with solar panels, connect to SMS, and do Bitcoin transactions there. And they don't have to interact with a bank that's going to take like a 10% cut. So uh, one of the areas that Bitcoin can do the greatest amount of good, the fastest for the um, greatest number of people is uh, through remittances. And in America, we don't really see remittance as a major part of our economy. Uh, but in most countries, workers uh, either leave their homes or, or come from other places to work in some of the world's hardest jobs for some of the lowest pay so that they can afford to send some money home to their families so their families can survive. And uh, it, it's, a huge, it's a huge industry worldwide. Um, in 2012 alone, migrant workers sent home $372 billion. And currently, with existing infrastructure, remittance are 
is charged up to 20% in order to send it. And the, it is charged higher in the poorer countries because their infrastructure is weaker. And it, it has a major impact on the living conditions and uh, survivability of some of the world's poorest people. And inflation is a major problem in a lot of uh, countries in the world too, much more so than the, in the United States. And so in the United States we don't see a lot of the problems that the world economy faces. In, um, in Zimbabwe, which is the poster child for runaway inflation, they, uh, they were posting 800 million percent inflation per month, and which resulted in printing of hundred trillion dollar banknotes. So authoritative governments uh, are spending more than they have and their central banks are creating money to finance debts. People are forced to watch their country's currency crumble and the result is always the same, poverty. Right, and what happens with massive inflation? You get a whole bunch of really, really, really pissed off people in the population that are suddenly like, now I don't have any money. After World War One, there's this huge inflation. Well, you could say inflation creates Nazis. I say that kind of jokingly, <laughs> but it's actually kind of serious. There's the Golden Dawn Party in Greece right now. They're, they're like economic problems cause societal problems. Bitcoin is the first currency that is deflationary. It's really not uh, something that's that's ever happened with a functioning currency in the past because it's always been possible to uh, to arbitrarily add more if the powers that be decide that they want to do that. And uh, in a little bit we'll explain how Bitcoin is different from that. Right, so Bitcoin has an upper limit of 20, about 21 million Bitcoin, and that's it. That's all there ever will be. And they, uh, the rate at which Bitcoin are discovered uh, decreases over time. So we uh, will approach 21 million Bitcoins in, do you remember what year? Uh, 2140. Yeah, so we're, we're not there yet, but there's a cap in the total number there will ever be. And after that, there won't be any new uh, Bitcoin added to the economy. And so as the value rises, uh, Bitcoin is extremely divisible, and so we'll just use smaller and smaller pieces of it instead of adding more and more to dilute the economy. So recently in uh, the Eurozone and in some other parts of the world, governments have uh, seized people's assets when um, their country couldn't pay its bills and they they started panicking. Uh, governments have access to bank accounts and central banks and they can basically do whatever they want and people can't stop them from taking money out of their account or um, like what happened in Cyprus the government needed to raise uh, um, seven and a half billion dollars really quickly so they had the bright idea that they would charge people a fee to take money out of their bank account or to move their money and so they could raise that money really quickly and people uh, were only allowed to take out a certain amount of money per day um, and so you had families lining up around the block uh, at ATMs and at banks every day with suitcases to pull out as much money as they could to try to get it out of the country um, as well they still can while it still had any value. Um, and, and this is in you know a, a first world nation just a few years ago. So the, the problem with having government able to uh, control, manipulate, and destroy the currencies of the world is its a serious problem and it's, uh, it affects the world uh, on a very large scale. So with Bitcoin, you can't have the government or somebody steal your money. As long as you are the only person that has the private keys, you are the only person that can access that money. Government can't seize your bank, your Bitcoin account. They can't freeze it. They can't prevent you from moving it across borders or exchanging it into another foreign currency if you want to. So.
So one of the um, consequences of governments behaving badly with their economies is uh, massive world poverty and it affects people um, greatly, much more so than we see here. Uh, and it's difficult for foreign aid to reach these people and it's difficult for uh, uh, wealthier countries and wealthier populations to do anything about people who are in poor nations who don't have access to infrastructure or banking and can't stimulate their own economy. So one of the major opportunities for Bitcoin is uh, to allow access to um, those communities, either through direct foreign aid from people anywhere in the world being able to send money directly to somebody in need with no intermediary, um, or for uh, people in communities to crowdfund uh, investment money for projects to stimulate their local economies or to, uh, you know, help help something in their village become a, a local economy and generate their own income. This is a picture that was discovered in Costa Rica recently of a wealthy person sending a beggar Bitcoin through a QR code on his smartphone while he was walking around and somebody anonymously made this painting. All right, so what is this like wonderful currency that is going to like solve a lot of the world's problems? It's Bitcoin. It's a distributed, trustless digital currency that's in some ways more ideal than all these fiat currencies. <coughs> it's peer to peer, and approximately every 10 minutes, the network has a sort of digital election to uh, determine uh, what is the state of the blockchain, and everybody then has it. Um, it's trustless in that you don't have to trust anybody to hold your funds. It's all mathematically backed with um, mathematics and cryptography. And it's backed, the value of Bitcoin comes from the full faith and confidence in the people using it. And this is actually the same thing as all fiat currencies. When I hold up a dollar, it's not like, it's, I don't have any gold behind it anymore. We got off that standard decades ago. We use a dollar and we trade it with people, knowing that it's going to be worth about the same thing because, I mean, you can use a dollar today and expect that the dollar is going to be worth the same tomorrow. Same with Bitcoin. You use Bitcoin today and you're going to expect that it's worth the same tomorrow. It's just backed by the confidence of everybody that's using it. The more people that use it, the higher confidence and the higher stability it will have. So Bitcoin is a money, and what's the definition of money? It's a medium of exchange. You can use it uh, for trade. It's a unit of account. You, it's able to be numbered and counted. Um, it's durable. It has a long usable life. It's divisible. It can be divided up into smaller and smaller units. Like uh, you can take change from a dollar. With Bitcoin, you can go all the way down to not just like cents, where it's like a hundredth of a Bitcoin. You can go all the way to a hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. Which makes it almost infinitely divisible. For all intents and purposes, infinitely divisible. And if we want to, if the network of all the people doing it agree to, we can make it go even more and more divisible. Uh, it's portable. It's easy to carry and transport. <coughs> and actually, um, as long as you have your private keys, you don't have to carry anything with you because you can access Bitcoin from anywhere. It's fungible. Units are uh, of equal value. So like my $1 is equal to your $1. My Bitcoin is equal to your Bitcoin. Uh, it's got a store of value, so it retains its purchasing power over time. Throughout history, only precious metals have really retained their um, store of value. Like all these fiat currencies eventually fall. Um, and so like, that's like gold and silver. Um, and that's because fiat currencies um, well, besides the countries falling, they have two other things, uh, counterfeiting and limited in supply. And so if Bitcoin is impossible to counterfeit, and um, it's what differentiates uh, Bitcoin from a any other digital currency, and it's limited in supply, it's, there's that 21 million and there won't be any more.
So the invention of Bitcoin um, is a monumental step forward in uh, technology and computer science. And what the invention of Bitcoin brings to us is this blockchain technology. And it's something that's never existed before. And uh, it's based on uh, mathematical advances in um, uh, based on the Byzantine generals problem which uh, is a problem about establishing trust um, between untrusted parties so that they can agree on something without having to trust each other and it can be provably um, accurate between untrustworthy parties. And so the, the creator of Bitcoin um, solved this mathematical problem that had been unsolved for decades. And Bitcoin is the, the use case that he came up with to prove that his solution worked. Uh, and this technology um, achieves a distributed network of trust that doesn't rely on any center, central intermediary, uh, like a bank or a broker or a government. Um, the technology has the potential to expend, extend far beyond just money, uh, and we can we can use it as a decentralized public ledger for other assets as well, like like deeds or stocks or bonds or promissory notes or. Uh, executing wills and things that we've always needed a central governing body to manage for us uh, and and now we have the technology to be able to manage these things for ourselves in a way that's that is uh, verifiable trustworthy and and can't be tampered with so the way that the the blockchain works is that only the owner of an asset can send it. So with Bitcoin right now the asset is is money and only the intended recipient can receive it. So nobody else can get it. Not a government, not a lawyer, or a broker. And the asset can only exist in one place at one time. So it, you can't send it to two different places and pretend like you have two of them. And everybody in the whole network can validate that transaction. And they can also uh, validate the ownership of all assets at any time that they want. So going back to the very first transaction, all of them are, are public and um, everybody has the same record of all transactions. So the transactions are stored on the blockchain um, with keys that represent people's addresses that are sending and receiving bitcoins. And everything is consensus based because everybody has the same identical copy of the blockchain. This empowers us against m monopolistic companies and institutions and this concept of a distributed consensus has never been achieved before. Okay, so we'll get into how Bitcoin works. From like a bird's eye view, what happens is a person creates a transaction and then they broadcast that transaction to their peers. Then everybody gets that transaction and they keep relaying it. Miners will pick up that transaction and if a miner creates a block, um, there they put some of those transactions into that block and they append it to the blockchain and then they broadcast that to everybody. And so there's this like flow of transactions through the network and then every like approximately 10 minutes a new block is mined and then that's distributed to everybody. So what a transaction is, is you can think of transactions like a chain. There's um, the transaction input has to equal the transaction output. So if you receive Bitcoin from somebody and say it was like one Bitcoin, well, you have to say, from this transaction, I got one Bitcoin, and here's where I'm going to spend it. I'm going to give it to this person, this person, and this person. And um, like say it's like 0.3 and 0.3 and 0.3. So and then you have 0.1 Bitcoin and change. Now, if you didn't um, specify where that go, it would be uh, given to the network as a miner's fee, and somebody who mined your block would get that. But you don't have to do that. You can specify where your miner fee is and that's how you do it. Um, minor fees are actually very, very low. They're like 0.0001 Bitcoin. Um, 
and you actually don't even have to put it in a miner's fee. You can uh, send a transaction without a miner's fee, it's just not guaranteed to get picked up. So, uh, so you take all the input, you specify where all the outputs are, and if you want, like you're sending 0.9 out of the point of the one Bitcoin, you can send 0.1 back to your own address. And so what happens is there's a like a chain of transactions too, you can think about it. Um, so you got this one, it went to these three, and then if one of these three wants to make a transaction, they refer to this transaction that I was just talking about and specify where that point three is going. So at any, any point you can take a look at a Bitcoin and track it back to when it was first discovered and, and look at the entire chain of every transaction it's ever been in. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's all these miners out there um, racing each other to solve a problem to get the next block. And what they're going to do is pick up the transactions that have the higher fees attached to them because it's their reward for doing the work to mine. And so when you send Bitcoin, you're sending it to an address. An address is this, um, it's a string of letters and numbers and it is, uh, it defines like where that Bitcoin is. And if you have a Bitcoin address, you should have a Bitcoin private key as well. These addresses are like email. They are... Um, if, you know, if you know somebody's public address, you can send them something. Just like if you know somebody's email address, you can send them an email. And uh, only, only if you know the private key can you access it. Just like only if you know the password to an email address can you read the email. Yes. Uh, and the, the, keys, the keys are um, mathematically linked. So they're, they're generated crypt cryptographically through asymmetrical uh, cryptography. And the, um, the keys are based on uh, multiplying and dividing extremely large prime numbers. And so it's very easy for a computer to check to see if um, w one of the keys is a, um, a solution uh, to its prime, but it's extremely difficult for it to generate guesses. So it's, it's trivial for it to take a look at a public address and a private key and say, yes, these match. But it's almost, it's literally almost impossible for it to guess at which private key goes to any given public address. Right, there's a 6.9595 decillion chance of guessing a private key for some public address. Uh, so imagine it like this. We'll play a game. I've got a hundred and forty trillion Earth-sized spheres. And on one of those, there's a square millimeter that wins. If you can find that square millimeter, well, you won. You get to spin the wheel. On this wheel, I have 22 million spots. And about 21 million of them have about a dollar or less of Bitcoin in them. <laughs> right. So. so, it's super, super secure cryptography. So, uh, there's more to Bitcoin than just uh, sending transactions from one thing to another. Um, they keep building on Bitcoin. One of the uh, things we're working with right now is multi-signature transactions. That means that uh, we can say uh, these public keys uh, are kind of like, they, they can sign <coughs> transactions from this address. And so if you have two of three, you need two private keys associated with those three public keys in order to send transactions from that address. And there, those keys are generated in really much the same way um, based on elliptic curve cryptography. So all three of the private keys are associated with the public key in that same asymmetrical uh, way. So it's like escrow when you're buying a house. Um, you, you put the money into an escrow account 
And once everybody agrees, like, like everything is final, let's do it, then we'll both sign, and then the money gets transferred wherever it goes. It's much the same if you're, like, buying something with multi-sig on, uh, like, say you're on Silk Road. Uh, you, you're, you're ha you have your relationship with your drug dealer, and you <laughs> deposit money into this multi-sig address. And then once you both agree that his goods or services like went through and everything was fine, and you both sign, and then the money transfers to him. Um, and there's also arbitration. So if there's a dispute, you can uh, assign one of the pri uh, one of the one of the holders of the multi-sig address to be like a dispute resolution person. And so uh, these two guys are in disagreements. The third person can come in and say, okay, I side more with this person. Those two will sign, and if it's two of three, well then the transaction goes wherever they decided. And it, it can also work like a, like a backup key, like making a spare key to your house or to your safe. You, you guys may have heard of the guy who like threw away a hard drive in a landfill with a bunch of Bitcoin on it, and other people who've, who have lost uh, the keys to their wallets and so they can't access them. Well, if, if that guy had backed up his wallet and he had um, set it up as multi-sig and he had another key in a safe deposit box somewhere, it wouldn't matter that his hard drive was in the landfill. He could just uh, um, take the other key, sign for it, and uh, recover it himself. And uh, they're building more um, on, into the Bitcoin language. Bitcoin right now has this like script language where the, it's like a, oh, what's it called? Uh, reverse Polish notation. Um, that's, that's what, uh, it's in every transaction. That's how things get validated. Uh, there are people working on putting a Turing complete language into the blockchain. And that really opens up so much that you can do. Um, so basically with that and your imagination to incentivize people to use your uh, new blockchain network, like you can create, you can automate so many things. There are even uh, theories about how you would automate uh, corporations and governments. Without having any central governing body that was, that was consensus based, that, that functioned um, Similarly to how the open source community functions now, where nobody nobody's working for anybody, and it's a it's a group effort, and yet somehow it functions and produces like amazing high quality um, content. So. Uh, Money is just the first app for Bitcoin. It, Bitcoin is its not just a currency. Um, a lot of what you hear in the news, its uh, they talk about it limited as a, um, an investment to speculate on or a currency to maybe use. Uh, and it's, it's far, far more than that. It's, it's a fundamental technology. And it's, uh, it's on the scale of like, the advancement of the internet and how that affected um, the 90s. This is a really similar um, period in time. And uh, the technology that's going to build on Bitcoin uh, blockchain technology is is monumental and we've only just barely begun to fathom what it can do so you can get decentralized file storage right so every transaction right now stores information about that transaction you could set it up so every transaction like uh, holds information about like a file you have and then um, you can uh, the instead of like miners you can have people being rewarded for hosting like hard hard drive space and being connected to the network and so it's distributed a bunch of people have it it's encrypted so they can't touch it but if you have the private key you can access uh, your files that are distributed across the network instead of trusting Dropbox to keep them safe and secure mm -hmm. and existing for you right and so then there's that like anything that's in the blockchain is like it's immutable you can't change it and so it's great for things like stocks bonds deeds contracts 
can do all that as well. That's that's coming very soon. With the uh, with the multi-sig technology, you could do something like um, execute a will to. Uh, donate your estate to your family or to your children um, when a death certificate can be furnished. And so that that will would execute automatically when the conditions were satisfied. You wouldn't have to take it to a judge or go through probate or, you know, have somebody else decide that it was valid. You could set it up so that it happened automatically based on the criteria that you set. Um, and a lot of these uh, uh, contract-based applications are being called Bitcoin 2.0, and there's there's several groups that are working on um, developing out this functionality. And some of it is uh, native to the blockchain, and some of it is being developed as like layers that can be added on top, or as separate blockchains that can function alongside. Bitcoin. You've probably heard of other alt currencies, and there's, you know, discussion about oh, is one of them going to take over Bitcoin, or is one of them better than the other? And and really, it's uh, it's all about the technology. So, whichever one has the network effect will probably be the dominant currency. But there. Uh, the blockchain technology is very compatible to have multiple um, currencies or blockchains working together or alongside each other or integrated into layers. Uh, it's not, it's really not a competition between altcoins. Like it, it's a new technology. We can have millions of altcoins and we probably will because now anybody can make one whenever they want. Like children can make their own digital currency and have one for their classroom or you know celebrities can make one and do you know terrible marketing things with it I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> but it'll all happen and there'll be tons of them and that's it's good that's uh, it's not it's not diluting anything about um, Bitcoin or or all of the things that it can do And so there's also advances in the mining of Bitcoin coming up. Uh, right now, there's this proof of work behind Bitcoin. Uh, you have all these miners like running all sorts of really difficult computation, spending a ton of money on it um, to mine the next block. And what it requires is solving this like really difficult puzzle. And then once they find a solution, they broadcast it to everybody. And it's a proof of work. It's a proof of, I did all this hard work, guys. Now, here's like the next block. And that's valuable because um, if you were able to just like make a bunch of blocks real quick, then you could play with the blockchain that way. You could say uh, there'd be a race of like this didn't happen, this did, no, this did. Well, since it's really difficult to do that and you have to have more power than uh, the rest of the network combined, it's partly what secures the network. And, and even if even if you could do something like that, people call it a 51% attack. Um, even even if you could theoretically get together enough computing power to pull off that attack, the amount of money that it would cost you is is vastly disproportionate to the total amount of money it's even theoretically possible for you to gain in such an attack. So it extremely disincentivizes even like the most evil nemesis from attempting something like that. So uh, a lot of people are complaining that, well, we're doing all this like hard computation and it's like taking a ton of energy to do it all just to support this network. And so there's people thinking, what's a better way to do it? Um, there's proof of stake. And so by having coins stored in the system, you will be more likely to forge the next block. So if you are a like a Bitcoin millionaire, and some new Bitcoin has a proof of stake system implemented, well then you're more likely to form the next block and get reward with the, um, uh, the mining reward. Um, and people doing this are Ethereum, PureCoin, and Next. Um, there's also proof by solving the world's problems. Uh, so there's PrimeCoin, which its mining is solve to create, uh, to discover uh, very large prime numbers. And there's also Gridcoin, which is based on Berkeley's Boink, B-O-I-N-C. And that's just like a problem of like curing diseases, global warming, discovering pulsars, and a bunch of other cool stuff. 
And one of the uh, criticisms of Bitcoin is that the network takes up a lot of um, power and electricity and thus resources throughout the world. Um, and that's, uh, you know, a valid, a valid concern, but it's also worth looking at the flip side of what is the alternative um, for uh, sending money in a, in a similar way using the existing system. And in that system, we have warehouses full of servers and uh, all kinds of infrastructure that is dramatically less efficient at processing transactions and uh, keeping track of records and moving money around. And so even though it does take electricity and my mining power is uh, um, you know, a serious resource, we're comp you have to compare it to what the alternative is, which is an extremely inefficient system and uh, much less um, distributed. It's much more concentrated into certain areas and has a much higher impact on, on some areas relative to others. Right, it's a single point of failure in those systems. So if they go down, the whole network goes down. With Bitcoin, even if uh, a whole country blacks out, Bitcoin's gonna stay up. And actually, uh, one of the core developers of Bitcoin is launching some satellites in the space. So even if like everything goes out on the surface of the Earth, we'll still have satellites in space broadcasting the Bitcoin network. <laughs> Richard Branson can take you up there and check on them. <laughs> you can use Bitcoins to go to space. He'll take you there. Okay, so um, how do I learn more? Yeah, okay, so, uh, yeah, how do you guys get involved? Um, it's, it's a participatory uh, community, so uh, all it takes to be part of the Bitcoin uh, community and the Bitcoin culture is um, to start participating, uh, learn more about it, and talk to people about it. Uh, try it out for yourself. It means a whole lot more when you actually do something with it and you get a little bit and you don't you don't have to you know make a huge investment or risk any money that isn't uh, you know you don't want to just play with it it's still worth it to get some and to see how it works and to send it to somebody and try it out for yourself because it's it's so powerful and it's hard to even grasp how different it is from our existing technology and from all of the centralized uh, control that we've existed with all of our lives and we're very used to and it's hard to think about how a system could even exist outside of that and playing with it is it's really accessible right so if you don't have bitcoin come talk to us and we'll give you a yeah bit. we'll give you a little bit not like a lot but like a bit in order just to play with. And give you your private key and you should move it right away because Cause we know the private key so <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah and uh, there's also um, a, it Bitcoin is is built um, by the open source community and it continues to be developed that way and that's that's how all of this stuff happens is is uh, the open source community and then companies who want to uh, innovate and build uh, industry and technology on top of it and so there isn't any like anybody in charge of Bitcoin and there isn't anybody who uh, you know you can you can go to and be like, oh, why hasn't this been done with Bitcoin? Or well, I think it should be do this. And so it, why is And then all the other developers will say, okay, go do it. Yeah, where's your code? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's how it's, it's done. And it's, uh, it's very accessible to anybody who wants to get in and participate and to help um, build the you know, front line of Bitcoin development. Yeah, and so if you, if you do want to make a change, you, you, you talk about it with the other Bitcoin devs. You agree on what should be happening. You pull requests, and um, you convince um, like most of the network to pick up the change. If most of the network doesn't pick up your change, well, it's going to be dropped. Just like other open source. And Noah just built a um, a library for uh, Bitcoin D. Yeah, Mono Bitcoin D. It's a C sharp Mono wrapper for Bitcoin D that it makes it easier to automate a lot of Bitcoin transactions. Yeah. Uh, but so you can go and view the the Bitcoin code right here, GitHub.com/Bitcoin/Bitcoin. You can sign up for the developers emails list at SourceForge.net/p/Bitcoin/Newman/Bitcoin-development, and uh, there's a great forum 
where a lot of these um, developers are constantly talking at bitcointalk.org. And the, we didn't put it up here, but there's, uh, there's also the white papers that were originally released um, announcing and describing Bitcoin. Uh, and they're, uh, you know, it's a technical paper, but it's, it's really accessible even if you don't understand the mathematics and the, um, the science behind it. It's still, it's worth reading. It's probably the best document to explain the fundamentals of Bitcoin. Um, and it's available all over the web, and it's, it's not even that long. It's just a few pages. Um, so uh, we'd like to have like a short question answer discussion for um, you know questions that you guys have. Yes. How the number twenty one million? Um, it's like the number is uh, it's what results from the decrease in um, new block new Bitcoin being discovered over time. So right now there's 25 Bitcoin being discovered with each new block, yeah. and uh, over time that gets halved. So there's going to be 12.5 Bitcoin, and it's going to be halved again, then halved again, and then halved again, and then halved again. And eventually, it's just going to be nothing. And the miners, their only reward will be all the miners' fees. And so it's going to take until 2140 before that happens. And when that happens, there's going to be like 20 point like nine 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 one Bitcoin. And the, the creator of Bitcoin chose 21 million, um, so that the, the network would be a self, self-adjusting scale, uh, so that it would grow um, at a rate proportionate to um, adoption, and there wouldn't be a massive uh, uh, def if inflation by uh, dumping a bunch of Bitcoin into the system before there was a proportionate number of users. So it's a really ingenious, brilliant uh, system to unroll a currency over time as its economy and network grows, so that it it has uh, it has the potential for for actual stability and and it hasn't like we're still very early days with Bitcoin and so obviously there's been volatility, um, but this the system is designed for long term stability and it's really quite brilliant. Yeah. I guess I'm just curious about security-wise. Like, for example, if somebody in Africa loses their cell phone, like what happens that they don't have a, a, a safe deposit box at the bank that we're trying to get away from? Mm -hmm. So now what happens? <laughs> well, you can back up your private key. And uh, onto, onto what? Uh, another cell phone, perhaps, um, or uh, you know a. a central computer that the village had or or something but uh, if you don't do that um, it's basically gone well, it's you can write it down on a piece yeah. of paper That's, and yeah. put it in a safe yeah. for like a yeah. goal. if you do lose your private keys and you don't have it backed up um, it's the same as losing cash there's no one you can go and be like I lost my cash can I have some more I swear I lost it somewhere yeah, yeah it's it's gone so it's a uh, it's something to be treated with that type of like immediacy and um, uh, to keep care of it. But it's easier than cash because you can back it up and you can't back cash up. How is that going to affect? So you have the 21 million. So people are losing their stuff. I mean, I've lost some addresses myself. Yeah. How much of that percent? I mean, at some point, you're going to have this major amount of Bitcoin that's lost and never is going to be able to be recovered. Yeah. So yeah, it, that's uh, it ties into the deflationary aspect of Bitcoin. So that over time, it'll um, that'll be an aspect of the deflation. But it's infinitely divisible, and so as the value rises, we use smaller and smaller pieces. And it's so we can lose plenty and have plenty to go around. Like we're not going to run out of Bitcoin even if we lose a whole bunch. So um, recently, there was an uh, issue with uh, mobile apps mining Bitcoin on people's phones. Uh, what app do you guys use or trust to, you know, present like QR codes to send each other Bitcoin? What, what do you guys use? I know you guys are helping a um, debit card, but <laughs> well, we're a big fan of Coinbase. Yeah, we support Coinbase. Um, BitPay is also great. Um, they're both solid companies. Uh, Coinbase is based out of San Francisco, and they're um, like super solid crew of like uber geniuses. Uh, backed by solid Silicon Valley money, um, they're not going anywhere, and uh, that's where I—that's the most trustworthy company, in my opinion, um, in the 
community right now. I'm not sure if they have one, but blockchain.info is a great site too. They're great too. Um, yeah, and actually we have uh, we have some flyers here that are about um, different companies in the uh, Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, uh, like a couple of different wallets and um, how to get Bitcoin. And these are all like community vetted companies, so they're um, they're they're like good players within the community and you guys can come up and grab one of these yeah. have them. Um, just curious, what can you use Bitcoins for? Like can you uh, go to the store and buy a gallon of milk with them or? That's a good question. Um, there's a growing uh, number of ways to use Bitcoin and so it's uh, it's Right now, it's pretty easy to use them online. There's a number of major retailers that will accept them directly, like Overstock.com and Tiger Direct, and uh, um, there's a there's a bunch of those are the two really big ones. Those, yeah, those are the two first publicly traded companies that accept Bitcoin. They started earlier this year, and they have seen a massive increase in sales um, as a result of it. I think uh, Overstock saw like five hundred thousand dollars of uh, additional sales in Bitcoin in their first Yeah, and so many companies weeks. are now paying their employees in Bitcoin. Yeah. And that's like the people who get paid in Bitcoin versus money ended up making like an order of magnitude more money. That's right. Yeah, blockchain.info um, gives their employees the option of being paid in Bitcoin. And, and the CEO said that uh, of the employees that chose to get their salary in Bitcoin last year, they made an order of magnitude more money than the employees that chose not to. And so, um, like, to answer your question, there like aren't a lot of brick and mortar stores right now that accept Bitcoin. There's like people like CoinKite who are coming up with like new point of sale Terminals, hardware. To, um, like take a card, like a Bitcoin card, okay. and um, accept it. But that means those merchants have to buy that system and set it up with their stuff in order to do it. And you can buy something person to person with Bitcoin as well. So you can send it to any individual and they can send you or give you um, whatever you want. And, and some uh, small local companies uh, set up to accept Bitcoin at the cash register through QR codes or um, over the internet. And uh, the difficulty in using Bitcoin for everyday purchases is actually the, um, the reason that our startup exists. We're trying to um, create a debit card that works on existing infrastructure that you can just swipe at any debit terminal and spend Bitcoin as easily as you spend regular money. Yeah, so the merchants wouldn't have to buy new hardware and integrate new software to do it. And we're working like literally day and night to bring this to you guys. So when we get it, I hope you all use it. Uh, yeah, so you, sort of one of the good things about Bitcoin is that uh, you know, there's no central authority controlling it. But let's say uh, someone pushes out a new version of the Bitcoin software with uh, you know, a change that you really, really don't like and 51% of the network agrees to uh, accept that change. Are your Bitcoins just worthless now? Um, your Bitcoins aren't worthless. Like, you can still decide not to support that new feature. So, so let, let's say that um, there was a new change in the software and instead of having a maximum of 20 million Bitcoins, there could be, you know, you could mine up to 40 something million Bitcoins or some arbitrary number of Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. You, you know, then essentially your current, your, your Bitcoins are worth a lot less. Now. Well, what, what your recourse would be is to get involved with the community and to make sure that changes like that that affect the community negatively don't happen. And so instead of having a centralized governing body that can do whatever it wants behind closed doors and all you can do is be like, hey, that sucks, um, you can be part of that community. So you can be part of the group that decides what happens to that software. Because that, that's all it is. It's made up of people. And so that people are who makes that decision and if you want if you want uh, you know a certain decision to happen or not happen being involved is is the way to deal with it but you're right if 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 the entire network which they wouldn't do but if they decided to raise the amount of bitcoin available um, it would in a sense make your bitcoin worth less 
it's that wouldn't happen. It, the, it's uh, the risk compared to a government that can just print money like day and night is um, it's a completely different scale of, of potential risk because you can't be involved in that decision for the government printing more money. I mean you kind of can with voting and stuff but you know it's not the same as being able to be a, a core developer if you want and uh, you know literally write the code that you want to see in there and, and show it to the community and have everybody talk about it. What's your guys' opinion on IRS treatment like a property? Because that could create issues for point of sale system. Yeah, um, I think it's a. Uh it's an unrealistic way for them to categorize it. It's not the end of the world. Um, it's it's going to cause some, uh, you know, um, accounting headaches and and whatnot. It creates a, a market opportunity for software that can automate uh, keeping track of that and uh, um, have that, you know, factor into taxes at the end of the year uh, and. It's also the treatment that most tax um, accountants who specialize in Bitcoin have been dealing with Bitcoin all along. So for people who are using Bitcoin as an investment, it actually makes sense. And um, there really isn't a great option for how they could decide to rule on it. And obviously the IRS is going to want us to pay taxes on Bitcoin. So it's, it's like, we have to pick among, well, we don't get to pick, but they get to pick amongst um, a bunch of options, none of which are like ideal. But um, treating Bitcoin as any other investment is, uh, it, it makes sense for people who are treating it as, who are using it as an investment. And for people who are using it as currency, I personally think that they're going to uh, revise that into something that fits a little more closely, but still enables them to get paid taxes for the use of Bitcoin. Can you um, talk about the, uh, I heard in the news uh, maybe like a month ago, where there was some money that was taken out of Bitcoin. Mount Gox. Mount Gox, the collapse and people lost money. Um, yeah, that, uh, had, that was a big exchange that um, was one of the, the first and the oldest exchanges um, in Bitcoin and it, it had been around um, for a while and when it first got started Bitcoin was much smaller, much less uh, serious, much, uh, much lower um, scale and that their company was not built for the business that it was doing up until very recently. And the people who were running it um, didn't handle it very well and uh, they their system failed from the inside and they kept quiet about it over time. But um, I mean, the community was really aware that there were major problems within Mt. Gox. And so um, it there had been signs that this was a failing exchange for over a year leading up to the point at which it collapsed. Um, and it's an example of um, how important it is to uh, check who you're trusting your money with because with Mt. Gox, they, you, um, you trusted them with your private keys. And so when you left money on their exchange, you're leaving your money with a third party. And so while Bitcoin isn't vulnerable to being hacked or um, shut down or having things stolen from it, third parties definitely are. And so this is the major weakness point um, of dealing with Bitcoin companies is you want to you want to be very careful before leaving your money with a third party. Right. So just to clarify, Mt. Gox, uh, they're not Bitcoin. Nobody owns Bitcoin. Mt. Gox is an exchange for Bitcoin. Yeah. They're just a private company that um, started out a long time ago and they, they happened to get really big as Bitcoin got big, but they weren't, they weren't designed for that. And so now there will be other stronger players that step in and um, can handle yeah. the future. Do you see equivalent for Bitcoin exchanges then? So that some, somehow there's, there's a back in that, like if you have your whole life in Bitcoin, it, at some point Maybe there will be one day, but not now. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no government to, to do that. So it would need to be a, a private 
organization or a you know an, a decentralized organization, and there's been discussion of it, but currently no, there's nothing like that that but exists. A lot of people think the most secure way to do it is to handle it yourself, because then nobody can take your funds. Which means keeping it like. Uh, keeping the private keys private to yourself. Yeah, not sharing However, them. you want to keep those keys private, which should be secret. And I think there will be um, like insurance policies for Bitcoin and Bitcoin companies. I've seen people discussing stuff like that. So I think it's a market opportunity for innovation. Yeah. How anonymous is Bitcoin? Um, is it as anonymous as cash? It's um, pseudonymous, which doesn't mean pseudo-anonymous, strangely enough. Um, so it's, uh, it can be very anonymous, but it's, um, you're basically, your transactions are referred to by your alias. And so if your alias is tied to you, then your transactions are tied to you. And if your alias cannot be tied to you, um, and it can't be proven that you can control the private keys to an account, then there isn't any way to prove that that account belongs to you. Um, so it, in, it's similar to cash in some ways that it depends on how much effort you put into it to be um, anonymous. Um, and it, the, the public ledger nature of the blockchain makes it so that um, it your transactions can be traced to a specific address very easily. Anybody can do it. It's trivial. Um, and how far away you want to keep your identity from that address, um, it, it depends on, on how you do it. So with regards to Mt. Gox and all that, um, why would I keep my private key with a third party instead of host doing it myself? Is it is just I'd have to host software myself if I wanted to do it, or what's the difference? Well, that's a great question. I think everybody should ask themselves that. Um, uh, the The main answer is convenience. So just like just like with any other financial service company with U.S. dollars uh, it, that you would trust your money to, it's you know you might put your money in a PayPal account. That's great. Well, if PayPal decides to uh, steal all your money and shut down, well, you sh you, you're screwed, right? Because you trusted your money to that third party. And so it's really similar. You know, you want to you wanna be careful and, um, and think carefully before you trust a third party because if that party um, disappears or shuts down or gets hacked, your money can disappear. Yeah, but the, the main thing, like you said, is convenience. Like, say you don't want to be responsible for keeping track of your own private keys. Like, say you have $100 worth of Bitcoin, and you have a private key, and you just kind of sillily wrote it on a scrap piece of paper, and like you left it sitting on your desk or something, and at some point fell in the trash can and got thrown away. It's like, oh, crap, I lost my private key to those $100. Uh, if you, um, like, just, you, like, use a password and maybe two-factor authentication for a service that holds your funds, and, and keeps track of your private keys for you, uh, it's just a factor of convenience. And if you educate yourself, you can really kind of do a risk assessment for like what is appropriate for which situation. And if you have a lot of money, it makes more sense to take extreme measures to keep it safe. And if it's money for just spending on everyday things, uh, it makes more sense to maybe have it somewhere that's really convenient that doesn't require that level of like hyper security. In the back. Does the blockchain just keep growing? Yes. Yes. Isn't that a problem? Uh, no, not really. Um, in you, for um, like everyday usage, uh, you don't need to refer to the whole blockchain. And so, really, the part that is in active use is the recent past. And it's all, it'll all be there for any time anybody wants to reference it, but in, for uh, you know, working use, you're really only concerned with uh, you know, going back a, a little ways. And so that, that amount going back isn't going to fluctuate that much, say, if you want to go back like the next well, last three months like your or so. addresses in the blockchain. So you might uh, like look through the blockchain and just like hold on to the data that is like transactions to and from your addresses. So then you know how much Bitcoin you have. Um, but right now it is growing. It's at about like 17 gigabytes right now. 
And um, but like Sky was saying, like you don't really need the whole thing. Uh, some people do, and it is going to keep growing. But what keeps growing also is uh, hard drive capacity. Also, I was thinking of just uh, transactions as it becomes more widely used, and eventually, maybe you know, everybody that's checking out in any store anywhere is using bitcoins. It's going to be you know, millions of transactions a second going into that blockchain. And that's that's why the um, the mining network is uh, designed to scale with that. So as those transaction, as that transaction volume grows, there's greater incentive for more people to mine because it's profitable for them. Yeah? Do you see um, like large banks uh, adopting their own mining uh, centers so that they can maybe uh, offer a service to their customers so that their transactions can go faster? Or is that, can that be I'm not sure I understand how exactly that works, but is that a possibility? Um, it's possible. It, it probably not. It doesn't. Uh, it wouldn't be economically viable for them to do that in general. It, it's like some specialized cases that might make sense, but it's it's not probably the first way that banks are going to get involved with Bitcoin. Just a. Uh Small question for, or big, small part of a big question, but do you know, like for the deflation, are they targeting a certain rate of deflation? Yeah, they're modeling it after um, how fast the gold mine gets mined. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, really grab my question. Anybody else? Okay, well, we're three minutes over, so. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And come up if you want to learn any more. <laughs>